from HanselMinutes.com. It's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 238, recorded live Wednesday, October 27th, 2010. Support for Hansel Minutes is provided by Telerik R80 Controls, the most comprehensive suite of components for Windows Forms and ASP.NET web applications. Online at www.telerik.com. In this episode, Scott talks with Phil Hack about ASP.NET MVC 3RC and the NuGet package. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman, and this is another episode of Hansel Minutes, and I'm here at PDC on the Microsoft campus, and we're hidden in a room in Studio E, because that was the only place we could find a quiet room, and my guest is Phil Hack. Hi, Scott. How you doing? How's it going, sir? Good. What are we releasing? Uh, so we're releasing ASP.NET MVC 3 uh, release candidate. Cool. Uh, a- among uh, a bunch of other products that we're releasing, uh, ASP.NET web pages, uh, web matrix, uh, all kinds of stuff. Okay. So MVC is marching on pretty fast. I mean, I'm sure that there are people who are still on MVC 1. We're working on that. Maybe skip the MVC 2 train. You know, is it going to keep going this fast? 3, uh, 4, 5? Are you trying to get to MVC 9 when IE 9 ships? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, that's the grand vision all along that, to hit vision. that alignment there, right? I figured so. Uh, yeah. I mean, right now, uh, I'd like to get back at least to a yearly cadence and, uh, at, at maximum uh, i don't know if i can survive uh continuing to keep the space up but uh uh yeah i mean there's always something to do there's always uh um great feedback coming from the community so i think a yearly cadence is kind of a sweet spot and so that's kind of what we've been uh on mm-hmm. uh, although it feels like this time around we're almost a little bit accelerated with the release candidate schedule but mm-hmm. um uh i think that's kind of a sweet spot where people feel like there's a uh, momentum but that we're not completely inundating them although you know the people who are still on dotnet 1.1 do kind of feel left behind sure is it hard to upgrade a 2.0 site to 3.0 like what's in what's the involvement in doing that uh no it's not going to be that hard we'll have a tool like we did for upgrading mvc1 to mvc2 uh the question is really do you want to upgrade to the new view engine the the razor view engine if you want to do that then yeah there's going to be a considerable amount of work to do if you are content with the webforms view engine you want to stay with that then the upgrade scenario should be relatively painless. Okay. So let's back up for a second and talk to people who maybe aren't on MVC. What is a view engine? What is a view engine? So a view engine in MVC is the um, part of the framework that takes your model that you've, uh, see, you know, request comes in through routing, hits a controller and a controller action. That action might query your database, query your object models, business logic, web services, and it formulates, uh, you know, this model for the view that what what are you what exactly are you going to display to the end user and so you send that off to the view engine and the view engine will render that in um, html uh, typically and uh, it will use one of the registered view engines to do that so it's a pluggable infrastructure so or an extensible infrastructure and so as part of that rendering you know we, um, it, the view engine will, is responsible for generating markup based on some sort of template file now, by default, we used uh, ASPX files or web forms, uh, web form view engine. That was in MVC 1 and MVC 2. But in MVC 3, we have a new option. So that new option is uh, the Razor view engine. And so uh, you can, when you start a new MVC 3 project, you can choose between one or the other. And uh, it provides a nice, really clean, streamlined syntax for doing, uh, um, for doing view generation. Okay, so a, the the language that I'm writing my view in, it, the this is going to be a little subtle, but I want to make this point to people who maybe haven't dug into it. I'm not writing it in HTML, or at least I don't have to. Like the output may be HTML, but the thing that I am writing, right, historically doesn't have to be HTML. Yeah, and so uh, you know, typically with view engines that we ship, it's a mixture of code and markup. But uh, there are third-party view engines out there that uh, completely, you know, buck the grain, right? There's a uh, Haml, nHaml, uh, nHaml, and they use a completely custom, you know, domain-specific language for generating HTML that has no HTML in the language itself, right? Mm-hmm. Use like little percents and indentation to control it. Uh, so yeah, um, other approaches use very declarative approaches. So uh, the code you write doesn't have to be. But typically, uh, like in the case of Razor. It's this uh, mixture of C-sharp or VB.NET code and HTML. 
And in ASP.NET, when I write this this view, whether it be web forms or Razor or web forms on MVC, I'm writing this mixture of markup and, and HTML, excuse me, markup rather in code, that gets compiled into some C sharp. Yeah. And then that it is that comp- compiled kind of intermediate file that then creates the the HTML that I want to render. Yeah. So uh, ASP.NET has this whole compila- runtime compilation model, uh, which sounds like an oxymoron, but it actually works. And so when you hit a page or a view the first time, uh, the ASP.NET runtime will compile that. And if you go to the temporary internet files, and like the, one of the tricks you do is you put a compiler error in your view and then have debug on, and you can view where um, ASP.NET actually puts the source code file. So you can actually go there and you'll see the code, and it looks like a bunch of response.writes, you know, mm. maybe how you might have done it back in the classic ASP day or something. So you're saying that if I go and write my own page and I go HTML, uh, bold, Scott, end bold, and then I do this trick to see the output, I'll see response.write, HTML, bold, da, da, da. Yep. Okay. Now, when you say web forms view engine, you're not literally meaning web forms in MVC. I'm not, it, it's just the engine by which you do that compilation. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, so uh, we went through a lot of iterations trying to name it. And so there's the, what we thought the technically correct name that no one would understand was, and then there's the... You What's know, that? Name. What's that name? Uh, well, all, all web pages and, and web forms are, um, and all user controls, which you can also use in uh, MVC as views, uh, all derive from a common template control class. And so, you know, like, if we want to be technically accurate, we could say, well, it's a template control uh, view engine. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that would not go over well. Yeah, that, that, that wouldn't have won any awards. You know, not that web form view engine naming did either. But. What are some things that people don't like about the web forms view engine when they're writing MVC that would cause you to go and make something like Razor? Uh, so the web forms view engine is, um, you know, there's a lot of extra what we you might call syntactic noise or or cruft uh, that goes in there. Um, code blocks are all delimited by a less than percent and percent greater than. Um, you uh, Just to make sure, because not everyone who listens to the show uh, speaks English as fast as we do, when you talk about syntactic cruft, you're talking about or syntactic noise. It's all the little things that are required because of historical reasons, like yes. less than, percent, my code, percent greater than uh-huh. that you really just care about outputting my code and here i have four or five six extra characters yes along yes. for the ride for no other reason than historical reasons yeah a lot of that kind of thing and also there's you know the the issue of like what the power of the view engine to express certain things like for example uh let's say you want to write a method that returns a bit of html so in C sharp you can do it, but you have to concatenate this really the string, right? And you know, like if I do input type equals text box, right? You would do return double quotes input type equals, and now you need to escape that quote and uh, and then um, in order to do the quote for the attribute value, mm. and then when you get to the value, you need to call HTML that encode or whatever it is. So. Um, so you're basically saying that in that instance, I just want to output some HTML, but then C sharps syntactic baggage gets in the way because of things like escaping quotes. So yeah. all, all these different kinds of languages that I'm using get in the way. Yeah. What's really cool about Razor is that uh, it has a really um, nice, clean syntax that kind of gets out of your way, helps you express what it is you want to do. You, you almost feel like it just flows out. And and part of that comes from its um, the fact that it actually understands sort of the structure of HTML and code. Mm-hmm. And uh, it has a very uh, powerful way of uh, interpolating code and markup together. And by that, I mean things like um, uh, if you do, uh, you can have helper methods where instead of returning a string that you concatenate together, mm-hmm. you just return and then you start, uh, you know, less than input type and start writing markup. Mm-hmm. And almost like a, a, a template within your code for returning HTML and within that markup, if you say value equals quote and then use the at sign, which which is your way of switching back to code, do at sign, you know, my value, mm-hmm. and then double quote and continue with the rest of the markup, that that transition there is really seamless. So I think we've it, that was interesting to me, and I was nodding, but I'm sure that people who were listening in their cars completely lost that. Yeah. So yeah. let's try this, because it's a podcast, and it's hard to talk about code in a podcast. But let's say I had a variable called foo. Yeah. And... 
uh, it's got a word in it, and I'm going to say at foo, and let's say at the end I put an exclamation point. So I've yeah. got at foo, exclamation point, where the exclamation point is, is butted up. It's shoved up right against foo. In the, in the past, that would be kind of a challenging thing. How does that work in Razor? So in Razor, that would work in that at foo, we go to the next character and we say, is that a valid expression? Is it part of the code expression? And we'll ha- we may have to look at the, even the next character because, uh, you know, let's say it's at foo dot, right? Mm. And like, so, a, like, like, like meaning that I'm going to say the end of a sentence, like at yeah. foo and then period. Like here's a classic example. I have a um, variable name, first name, and then I print out, you know, uh, big bold tag, you know, slash B and slash mm-hmm. hi at first name dot. So I want to say hi, Phil Hack, period. Yeah. So what Razor can do is it can figure out that that period is meant to be part of the text and markup and not part of your expression because it looks at the next character and says, well, that next character is a space or a less than or something that couldn't possibly be valid for code. So in that case, uh, we know that we're back in markup mode and then we do the right thing. And there's a lot of cases where Razor just does the right thing. And, y- you know, y- when you don't, th- when you're just doing it, you realize, oh, you know, whatever. But when you think about it, you're like, wow, how did that work? <laughs> right. It's interesting. When I started learning Razor, my first impression was, this is really confusing. I have to know all of these rules. Mm-hmm. But then when I started working on it for my talk here at PDC, I started realizing that the less you think about it, the better. Uh, yeah. And it will usually do the right thing. My favorite example that I show people is I have this uh, list of objects, right? An array. And I want to, generate a uh, an unordered list in html so with the web form view engine you did less than percent for each uh you know var item and whatever and then percent close and then you know you do the li tags in the middle and then you close you have to right so to translate that you make a for loop and you have your list item your list item but you're going in and out and in and out of code view and markup and code view and markup yeah and and around the for each block you have to have code nuggets and on the closing code nuggets is that what they're called yeah less than percent percent greater than that's a code nugget code nugget yeah so you don't want to leave these code nuggets all over the place right but uh so but then you need the code nugget just for the closing curly brace right Uh, oh you need for loop yeah you need less than percent curly brace and then percent less so you need like what is that five characters yeah, five non-space just, characters. Just to say, I'm done now. I'm done with this code block. With this code block. And so this gets back to what I mentioned earlier about Razor being, uh, uh, Razor understanding the structure of code and markup. Mm-hmm. So what you do in Razor is you do at for each var foo in whatever, uh, open curly oh, Wait a brace. second. So you say at, and you just start writing code. You just start writing code. There's right. no parentheses or brackets right. or anything to, to put around it. Exactly. You just at, start writing code. And when you're ready to start emitting markup, you just use a less than. Okay. Use uh, you know, you just use uh, you just start writing markup. So I would do at for each var foo in whatever, you know, close the for loop, uh, open the curly brace for the for block, and uh, then I would type like slash l or less than li greater than you know. So you, like, you do your you go at you start writing c sharp. Yep. And the way that you stop and like start writing markup is you just start, start writing, writing markup. markup. Exactly. You don't need to close that for, you know. When do you close the whole for loop at the end? Uh, when you do the closing curly brace. Because that's not markup. And what if I wanted a curly brace? Then you have ways of escaping it. I see. Hi, this is Scott coming to you from another place in time. Are you using agile practices to manage your software development? There's lots of tools in the market that manage the steps of a project, but most of them focus on individual roles. Get ready for a solution that caters for the success of the whole team. The guys at Telerik introduced Team Pulse. It's an agile project management tool that will help you gather ideas, estimate, plan, track progress in a common workspace. Finally, companies, regardless of their size, can use a lightweight and convenient tool that makes all the stakeholders work as a united team, even if they're in different countries. By combining intuitive user interface and the power of Serverlight, Team Pulse removes the roadblocks that you typically face in applying agile in an effective manner. No more lost data, no disparate systems, no lack of critical analytics regarding the health and velocity of your project. See for yourself, get a free copy for five users and one project at Telerik.com slash Team Pulse. And please do thank Telerik for supporting Hansel Minutes on their Facebook fan page, Facebook.com slash T-E-L-E-R-I-K, Telerik. We do appreciate it. There wouldn't be a Hansel Minutes if there wasn't Telerik helping us. Now, a lot of people who may be into MVC might think that this sounds a lot like Spark 
and people have made comparisons between the Spark view engine, which is a very HTML markup focused view engine. And they've said, well, Spark seems a lot like, like Razor. If you dig into it, they're actually quite different. But why do you think those comparisons are initially made? Uh, I think because, uh, Spark is very popular among those who, you know, keep track of these things. And, uh, it's a very, um, clean, view engine as well and so there's sort of this comparison of oh both of these approaches are very clean uh lewis uh de Harden, or I, I always get his, his i think it's L- lewis de jardin lewis de jardin but i always pronounce it like he's french and i say louis de jardin which is totally wrong because i think he's from like the midwest somewhere yeah well i think his name is french but anyways really, really he is not french but he's not french indeed okay then uh, he, but he's a very smart guy and so he's the <laughs> <laughs> regardless of being french or not he's brilliant Lewis is a, he's a brilliant guy and, uh, he joined Microsoft and he was, you know, involved in some of the design, you know, um, discussions around this. And mm-hmm. he had a really interesting insight. He felt that, um, what Razor is, is really taking this code driven approach to doing templating, where Spark is very markup driven, uh, and declarative approach to mm-hmm. doing templating. So they're sort of like two different sides of the same coin in terms of, you know, do you want your code to drive this or do you want, uh, markup to drive it? Mm, so when the, when you answer the question why didn't I why didn't we Microsoft just use Spark as it was why uh, so that that goes back to uh, sort of the overall web strategy where we have this new offering called ASP.NET Web Pages uh, which targets a more beginner audience uh, initially and so the idea here is that you know we wanted to have this very simple. Uh, streamlined, very imperative model for developing simple web pages, mm-hmm. uh, and but that the knowledge that you learn doing that, you could graduate up to uh, ASP.NET MVC. And we felt that keeping the same syntax for both models uh, made sense, and we felt that this syntax really worked well, um, especially for those who are coming from, you know, let's say PHP or classic ASP background, or have heard of those things. Yeah. They really, you know, they, they would be familiar with this model of doing uh, web development. And I would definitely encourage listeners to go back into the uh, Hansel Minutes archives and listen to the show I did with Louis Lewis uh, on Spark, and he gets more into the details of that. And I assume that we can choose any of these. Like, just because Razor is the default, I could use Spark, or if I like web forms, I can use that. Can I mix and match them in my in my same pres- in my same uh, project? Yeah. So uh, part of the work we're doing for MVC three is to make um, to put other view engines on more of an equal uh, platform. So, for example, uh, you will be able to plug in into the uh, file new project dialog. Um, there's two choices you're given. Uh, Razor is the first choice. Web Forms is the second, and then um, you can hook in other view engines in there. If you want Spark in there, you can put it in there. Mm. Also, in the Add View dialog which has this ability to scaffold um, your model, uh, you can choose which view engine you want the scaffold to be created with. And then, uh, so you can put Spark in there. And we'll be working with Lou and his team and the uh, Spark team to help them have that ready, hopefully by the time we RTM. Okay. RTM released to manufacturing uh, released, or RTW, RTW released to web. Is, yeah, RTM is kind of a anachronism for that. And then, so, <laughs> yeah. and if you want to mix and match, you could have partial views, for example, in one v- view engine, but the main view in another. So if you were doing some kind of transition over mm-hmm. from one view engine to another and you just wanted to call this existing partial that was ASPX, that will just work. So it's really about picking the tool for the job. Like I've even seen people take view engines and use them to render um, HTML email. Like you might have an application that makes an email. Yeah. You could do all of your main pages in Razor and you could say maybe Spark is more appropriate for your mm. e- email generation or, or whatever. Yeah. And in fact, Razor is actually going to be very good for those kind of scenarios as well because much like Spark, it's uh, fully hostable. And by that, I mean you can write a console app that t- makes use of Razor. And Andrew Nurse, uh, the developer on Razor, has, I think, a really great blog post that hmm. he needs to update, but for the latest version. But I see. he has a blog post about how you could, like, use a Razor um, template to generate, you know, something using a console app. Right. So not tied to web uh, ASP.NET too, t- too tightly. In the past, Microsoft doesn't really make things that componenty. Like, just that scenario, like the idea that, oh, yeah, I might want to do this outside. You know, in, in kind of classic ASP.NET in, in the old days, it's not quite that... That component is that something that you are pushing as the feature PM, or is there like an idea virus that's finally reached inside of Microsoft that's saying, make stuff reusable? 
Uh, I think I think it's a little bit of both. I'd like to take credit for all of that, but I think the I think that idea was already there. <laughs> I think that idea had kind of started to take hold and I think that's why people like me were brought in to kind of perpetuate that idea, right? Mm -hmm. And to uh, push for that. Uh, The ability, and a lot of that is driven by simple little things like um, we want people to be able to write unit tests of their code, right? Just like, you know... Values. You're expressing a value. Like, yeah. as a team, we value yeah. these things. We value this. Uh, our customers value TDD and they want to be able to do it without too much friction, Right. So when you have those values, then these things kind of fall out of it, right? Well, I can't write a unit test of my view code if my view code has these deep hooks into the runtime that have to be present in order for that code to even run. And that's what that's the situation you find yourself in with, you know, web form view engines, unfortunately, for legacy reasons. And so with Razor, though, we don't have those that legacy baggage, as much of that legacy baggage. So we can take a look and say, well, can we make this more of a library that's callable from any context rather than having this deep coupling between uh, ASP.NET and Razor? So switching um, gears a little bit, speaking of reuse, I'm thinking uh, the, the, the previously the new, what was called the new pack project and has now been renamed to new get. Mm hmm. N-U-G-E-T, and we'll hopefully have all that updated at uh, newget.org, and that'll redirect you to the, all the appropriate places. Yep. Is that is shipping in MVC? or? So yeah, NuGet is really interesting in terms of how it's shipping. It will be included as part of MVC3 in the sense that when you install ASP.NET MVC3, you will have a new pack installed. NuGet. Oh, NuGet. <laughs> you got me. See? I got gotcha. you. Yeah. We had to rename it because there's a group at Caltech that has a nucleic acid package. And while we didn't think that they really conflicted, they, they do conflict because they're uh, both software packages and they made a very kind request. And we were, you know, since this is the beginning of something, the Outer Curve Foundation that owns the new pack name said, let's switch that over. Yeah, so to provide context for those who don't know what the heck is... The oh, that's outer, a good point. What are we talking about? The Outer Curve Foundation. Yeah. It's not the Outer Space Foundation. Yeah, so so there's a bunch, a bunch of weird naming stuff going on. Code... I always thought codeplex.com was where you put your source and codeplex.org for organization is the organization. I thought that was crystal clear. Apparently, I'm the only guy who thinks that's crystal clear, <laughs> that that using a top-level domain is, yeah, is you, reasonable. You thing. can't see this, but I'm shaking so, my head. <laughs> yeah, I know. So codeplex.org, the foundation for open source, which is not a Microsoft thing, it's a separate organization, renamed themselves to the Outer Curve Foundation. Outer mm-hmm. Curve. Say what you like about the name, that's what they renamed. Yep. Coincidentally, at this uh, in, in, a, in a similar time frame, within a couple of weeks, the you know guys at Caltech were like, "Hey, we have a thing called New Pack. We've had it for five or six years. You know, I know you think it doesn't conflict. We think it does." And then we had just started New Pack, the package management system. We said, "Well, we'll change it." Did a bunch of votes. A lot of different names went by, and we changed it to New Get. New Get. Yep. And what's great about New Get that's really I think interesting is that New Get is a, a fully open source project. We assigned it over to the Outer Curve Foundation, mm-hmm. and that means we can accept contributions. Uh, so unlike, you know, ASP.NMC, which, you know, not we can't accept contributions, you know, code contributions from people yet. Mm-hmm. But uh, with New Pack, uh, New Get, uh, this is going to take me it's a little while. It's going to take you a long to, time. I, know. I wanted New- to call it like Phil Get or Hack Pack. I like Tack Pack. Hack yeah. Pack. Some people uh, said a Goo Pack. Goo Pack? Yeah. Yeah. Because that's the legend that anything that we release, Scott Goo wrote in an airplane yeah. the day before. But I pointed out it sounds like Goop Pack. Goop, goop Pack? No. <laughs> okay, so NuGet is an open source project. Open source project. We accept contributions from the community. And have fact, we already? Yes, we have. Oh. We, uh, and, and core features as well. So we've had real features implemented that will ship. And here's the best part. This is will ship within Visual Studio at some point. That's cool. Yeah, it's interesting. I upgraded to a new build last night. And noticed that one of the main dialog boxes, like, you know, a whole feature within tools options inside of Visual Studio had changed. So I chatted one of the guys who is a Microsoft developer working on the project and congratulated him. And he said, no, no, a guy in the community did all that. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I, I, that's going to take a while getting used to. Yeah. I know that we're a little bit, Microsoft is a little bit late to the open source game. But I, I hope that this is going to um, represent a whole new opening 
of open source, you know, at Microsoft. Yeah, yeah, you know, there, there, there are those who will criticize, well, you know, Microsoft's coming really late to the open source game. But at the same time, you know, it is Microsoft, and the fact that they're coming at all is, I think, a good thing, yeah. and the fact that we're pushing it forward. I mean, when I joined, almost nothing was open source at did, Microsoft. Did we join at the same time? Yeah, roughly, yeah. You yeah. were uh, three months, I'm months three years. I'm three years this month. So I was three years uh, in no, October. No, wait a second. You're more than three no, years. No, three, three years. years I, October 15th. You're right. I joined. So you're three years last week, and I joined in like July. Yeah. So, so I'm three years and some change. And some change, yep. Okay, yeah. And we, we're trying to turn turn this giant battleship around as long as uh, – with other people like Glenn Block and, and uh, Garrett Serak and lots and lots of different people. But we're all little people. Yeah. Trying to turn this thing around. And it's, it's uh, you know, it's, I think what really helps is that uh, we have a big gun, you know, who's, who's interested in seeing this happen. And that's, right. More and more bosses, yeah. at least within our division, get it. Get it, yeah. Like before it's like just the lowly people and then it's the general manager and then it's the vice president and you just spread that idea of virus around. And now that we've got what we call in, at Microsoft air cover, <laughs> right? Air cover means that, uh, someone who's really high up at the company thinks what you're doing is a good idea. Uh, now that we all have air cover, I hope that we see more open source. Yep. Yeah, and I think NuGet really fits well into this uh, movement. And what NuGet does is, let's say, l- let's say I have a, um, I'm building a, I'm developing a project, a web application, and I want to get uh, a really cool library I heard about. You know, Elma is one example. Right. Error logging, error logging modules and handlers. Yeah. Elma. Very, uh, very creatively named. Mm-hmm. And so uh, there's a lot of steps just to incorporate that library into my project. You know, I need to put it in some folder. I need to find it, download it. You know, if I download it with IE or Chrome, unblock it. Um, you know, z- put the DLL in a known location, add a project reference to that. And if I'm a web app, I need to add some config sections to my web.config file. Uh, for a library like Fluent and Hibernate, there's even more steps where Fluent and Hibernate itself has dependencies on other libraries, which may themselves have dependencies. So we have to, so you know, you have to track all these dependencies, and then uh, then you run into the situation where uh, that I run to working on an open source project called Subtext, where I'm u- now that I'm using 15 of these third-party open source libraries, mm-hmm. um, and I'm ready to release the next version of my project. Uh, how do how the heck do I know which ones need to be updated? Right. Like I go to what I used to do is I go to each one, I, I search for the project page, and I try to find and oh yeah, there's a new mm-hmm. one. Yep. Okay, I'll grab it. Oh well, how does that change my dependency change and all that? Right. So NuGet is going to NuGet attempts to solve this problem. Right. I mean, the lack of a .NET package manager has been a huge problem for years. Yeah. And there's been a number of attempts in the community before NuGet, like NGEM and Horn and different things, as well as New. Uh, a project that uh, was doing the same thing with Ruby Gems, and then also now OpenWrap, uh, which can consume NuGet uh, feeds. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's a lot of interesting work happening in package management right now, yeah. and a lot of collaboration. And we're going to be hosting a feed of all of this stuff. Yep, yep. And uh, hopefully in the next few months, we'll see that kind of uh, more details emerge. Yeah, so currently we have a temporary feed that you can go to and you can put your packages up there to test them out and uh, mm-hmm. you can download these, these things. But uh, there's a separate project that's underway that will um, produce a full-fledged gallery for packages. And that gallery source code will be hosting our gallery, our, our official NuGet gallery. Uh, but that source code will also be given out as an open source project. So anyone who wants to host their own feed can make use of it. Cool. And of course, you can also make uh, a gallery of your own inside your company on a on a file share somewhere. And you just say, look, there's all the packages. That's correct. So, uh, which is a really nice feature of NewPack is that you can just drop, take a folder share, drop a few uh, files in there. And, Did you uh, say NewPack again? NuGet. <laughs> <laughs> Caught me. Yeah, so you drop some files in there, and then you just uh, um, add uh, in the NuGet dialog, uh, options dialog, you can add a set of package sources. Right. And that source can be a URL, like HTTP colon whatever. Yeah. Or it can be, you know, um, C colon slash packages on your local machine, or... Mm-hmm. Slash slash, you know, computer name slash packages. So even internally at at your own company, you could share closed source packages that your enterprise shares if you felt like it. Yeah, and I, I've already known uh, of a big enterprise who's moving to that direction where they have a lot of like internal libraries that are very specific to their projects, mm-hmm. uh, and that they're now moving to using NuGet to uh, manage those. Okay, cool. So uh, MVC three release candidate yep. will include part of this. 
Mm -hmm. and then they can uh, go and get it themselves at CodePlex. Yep, you can go to CodePlex.com and you can build from source, and we'll also put out uh, releases, updates through the Visual Studio Extension Gallery. Okay, and then in the future, at some point, uh, when all the ducks are in a row, this will be available for Visual Studio in some future update. Yeah, so uh, it will be when it will roll into Visual Studio as part, when the next version of uh, MVC rolls into Visual Studio. All right, very cool. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Scott. All right, let's go. It's PDC uh, week here at the Microsoft campus, so let's go do our meet and greet and have some pizza because that's what we're doing right now. All right, let's do it. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes. I'll see you again next week. Mm-hmm.